Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. A doorbell camera captures a local councilman who appears to be up to no good when it comes to other people's campaign signs. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at 6. I'm Karen Drew, in for Kimberly Gill. And I'm Damon Fernandez, in for Devin Skillian tonight. That councilman in question is Gary Schlack, and he's up for re-election in Allen Park next month. Sean Lay is live at City Hall tonight with how Schlack is explaining the video so many people have seen on social media. Hey there, Sean. Had a lot to say to us on the phone. He just walked in for the six o'clock council meeting. Council member Gary Schlack. There was a working council meeting going on, a council session between five and uh, six o'clock. He was not there for that, but again, right before six o'clock, he walked in, said he would be here, said he would read a very short statement about this. We'll see if others have something to say about his behavior inside in a yard, a person's yard. I spoke to the person whose signs were damaged in her own yard. She says she checked her ring doorbell camera and immediately knew it was council member Gary Schlack. Allen Park City Council member Gary Schlack tells me, yes, that is him in this video, putting up his own campaign sign in a person's yard that had been placed off to the side by a homeowner, while stomping on a candidate's sign for mayor and folding up a sign for another council candidate. It happened over the weekend, Schlack coming up onto the property of a homeowner to do this, caught on her ring doorbell camera. The homeowner tells me when she checked her camera, what she saw was upsetting. Yeah, it just it just hurt because um, it made it upsetting because he was a friend of ours. Um, didn't think that having other candidates on our lawn would affect that. Schlack tells us that he was frustrated saying many of his signs are missing, but he could not say how many and from what locations. In a now deleted Facebook post from Schlack, he wrote, Hi all, I went to fix a fellow candidate's sign today. Fixing the sign. Yes. Is that, what do you make of that? Well, it wasn't damaged until he picked it up out of the ground and folded it. Robert McLaughlin is the campaign manager for council candidate Tim Estheimer. One of Estheimer's signs was pulled from the ground. In the same Facebook post from Schlack, he goes on to write, I did a very bad and petty thing. McLaughlin says the race for council, however, has not been contentious at all. This has not been a bitter battle, you're saying? No. It hasn't been like, oh, crazy down here. No, it's okay. very, very amicable. And everyone was going to get a seat anyway? Yes. I mean, there's with the write-in candidate, there's always the toss-up who's going to be the odd man out, but there's only seven people running for six seats. Back here live, I can tell you, there's a lot of talk, a lot of buzz about the video and Schlack's behavior and him coming to the meeting tonight. What will he say besides that very short statement he read to me over the phone? He tells me he has an attorney. He's uh, consulting with the attorney. I asked him if he was going to resign. He said, I'm not stepping down. Uh, that's about it so far, guys. People are saying there's been no apology as of yet. We'll see if that's going to be forthcoming. Live in Allen Park, Sean Lake, Local 4. Back to you. Well, Sean, curious to see what happens at that meeting tonight. Thank you. It's been a fourth day of chaos and fear in the Middle East as Israel appears to be preparing for military action in response to terror attacks by Hamas. According to Israel's defense spokesperson, tens of thousands of Israeli troops are on the move for a possible ground operation in Gaza. It's part of what the country is calling its largest short notice mobilization in history. Hamas today responded to that troop presence by firing hundreds of rockets toward a city in southern Israel. The group warning residents to evacuate hours before the 40-minute barrage, much of which was shot down by Israel's missile defense system. Now, despite all this, the U.S. State Department has been in contact with several airlines, encouraging them to resume flights in and out of Tel Aviv. President Biden delivered a message of support for Israel this afternoon. We must be crystal clear. We stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. The loss of innocent life is heartbreaking. Like every nation in the world, Israel has the right to respond, indeed has a duty to respond to these vicious attacks. I just got off the phone with a third call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I told him, the United States experience with Israel is experiencing our response to be swift, decisive, and overwhelming. Right here tonight on Local 4, Lester Holt is on the ground in Israel for a special edition of NBC Nightly News. Lester and his team taking cover several times today as sirens blared overhead in Tel Aviv, part of the everyday life in Israel right now.
At 6.30, Lester takes you inside a hospital treated by, who is treating Israeli wounded and also speaks with an American man who heard his mother's abduction over the phone. That's tonight at 6.30. It was a controversial court day today for a man convicted of killing his stepmother in her Warren home back in 1983. As a minor, Joseph Bazetta was originally sentenced to life without parole, which courts recently decided is in the constitutional. Victor Williams is live with this new sentence handed down today. And Victor, this raises questions and the possibility that he could go free. Yeah, that's right, Damon. And really, all of this has been in the making for about 40 years. But with this resentencing, family members say that it feels like it's going to last even longer. It is the court's best judgment that the defendant hereby be sentenced to a term of 40 to 60 years. Joseph Bazetta was serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, but all that has changed now. Credit has to be assessed about 35 years of credit. With the new resentencing, the 58-year-old may be eligible for parole in five years. The ruling comes at the dismay of family members and loved ones of the person he's convicted of killing in 1983, his stepmother, Helen Roberts. That means that he will become eligible for parole at some point. We don't know exactly when, and we don't know what that parole board will find. But for sure, the family will be there, and we will have to relive it again and again. And that's just hard. Ever since it was deemed unconstitutional for a minor to be sentenced to life without parole, there's been a lot of uncertainty regarding what that means for Bazetta. He was just two months from turning 19 when he was convicted back in the 80s. His attorney, hoping to get a time served sentencing, spoke about how he's changed. Mr. Bazetta has gone so long, many years without misconduct. He could speak in of itself. Yet the aftermath of his crimes are still affecting many loved ones to this day including Helen's son. Let's keep the psychopathic murderer behind bars so that he cannot torture another human being or family. And still family members say they'll continue to be strong for the woman they lost. No doubt it's hard um, to relive how gruesome the crime was, no doubt. But I'm proud of my cousin today. I'm proud that my uncles were there to represent. I'm proud that we could come together and honor her memory and know that we're doing everything that we can. Now, Bazetta did take accountability for his actions in the courtroom today, but still, we know that doesn't change much. Victor Williams, Local 4. Okay, Victor, thank you. It didn't last long. The Canadian auto worker strike against General Motors ended today, less than 24 hours after it started. Yet at the same time, the United Auto Workers stand-up strike is now in day 26. Well, Local 4 Business uh, Editor Rod Maloney is here with a look at what's happening, particularly with the ripple effects, Rod. Yeah, we'll be looking at that uh, very closely here, Damon. You know, across the river, across the Detroit River, all that's left is the rank-and-file voting on that tentative agreement struck today during the day. As for the UAW, talks continued. We're told that they're active, but they're not producing much. The ripple effect continues as we're seeing now the strike impact spreading. At Stellantis, they say they have storage constraints, meaning too many parts to store. So they've sent more than 600 line workers home on layoff. More than 500 at Trenton Engine, 50 at Kokomo Casting, and 70 at Toledo Machining. Another 300 who'd been sent home from Kokomo Transmission went back to work yesterday. Over at Ford, the original layoffs from the Michigan Assembly Plant paint shop remain off the job. 184 at the Lima Engine Plant, 75 at the Sterling Michigan Axle Plant, Take the number of layoffs to 859 there, but Chicago Stamping sent 243 workers home after the Chicago assembly plant went quiet a week ago Friday under the stand-up strike. Livonia Transmission now laid off nearly 400 line workers and another 372 furloughed, taking the full total to 1,865 line workers laid off because of the strike, the union adding all these workers to their strike fund pay list of $500 a week. Over at General Motors, it's the only company to close an entire assembly plant because of the strike affecting another. The Fairfax, Kansas plant is quiet, laying off just under 1,600. The Lockport, New York components plant sent home 48 workers. Toledo Propulsion laid off 426. And then there's the Marion Metal, Parma Metal Centers, along with the Lansing Stamping Plant, laying off nearly 250 more. And General Motors now has more than 2,300 workers off the job due to the strike. 
Now, UAW President Sean Fain is quite frustrated by this and a lot of other things, of course, but he says the companies have the cash to keep these workers on the job and are choosing to spread the pain when they don't have to. Ford's Labor Affairs Vice President is saying that strike-related layoffs are an unfortunate result of the UAW's strategy. You mentioned ripple effect, obviously. Mm -hmm. Take a look at auto suppliers. Yeah, what the, are they dealing the with? suppliers, well, we're seeing what they call war notices. They re mm -hmm. report to the state that they're going to have to lay people off, and we're seeing hundreds of those already. And, you know, the, the supply base is a situation where they have already had trouble with supply chain and other issues, right. especially the lower tier, two, second, and third tier. Mm -hmm. They're struggling mightily financially, and this is not helping them at all. all right. Wow. Thanks, Rob. We appreciate it. Well, police in Canton are asking for the public's help right now in two different cases. They want to find and speak with the man pictured right here. He's accused of having inappropriate physical contact with a female in a public place. We're told he may use a bicycle to get around, but was last seen on foot just after the incident occurred. Now, if you recognize him, you're urged to call Canton PD. Investigators are also hoping the public can help them identify this guy or at least get a clearer video of him. He was seen wandering through neighborhoods near Ford and Beck Roads in the early morning hours of October 2nd. Detectives want to talk to him about a string of vehicle break-ins. If your home security system spotted him or if you know who he is, you're, so, you're also urged to call Canton Police Department and ask for Detective Kelly. All right, let's talk about our forecast. We got a little bit of rain, a little bit of gloom, kind of perfect. Halloween weather, right? I'm <laughs> trying to think of something positive here, Kim. <laughs> I guess that's one way to look at it. Yeah. Yes, we've definitely eased ourselves into fall and that 80 degree weather we had last week is long gone. There's spotty showers all over Metro Detroit right now, anywhere from sprinkles to just some light rain. But we'll continue to see this action for the next couple of hours at least and maybe even into the overnight hours in some spots. It's also cool. Temperatures are in the upper 40s in Pontiac, Mount Clemens, also in Port Huron. Metro has now dropped down to 48 degrees. Some of this is rain cooled air with the sprinkles and it is cooler than it was yesterday by seven degrees in the city. Six degrees cooler right now than it was yesterday in Pontiac and five degrees cooler in Mount Clemens and in Port Huron. Lots of rain up to our north over into the thumb Port Huron getting some showers at this hour and if you notice back out to the west there is more rain in Grand Rapids. Tomorrow we'll see the rain come to an end. Could be a spotty shower but most of the day will be dry and finally we crack 60 degrees. But then we're back to cooler weather again and lots of rain for the weekend. We'll talk about it in a few minutes.